great. Um, it sounds like we have a nice wide array of perspectives ourselves in here, which is good, and hopefully we can flesh out each other's picture of, of the puzzle, of the school, the students, our time. Um, and I think that's important because what I, one of the things that I want to focus on is structurally the barriers to students having a full, complete perspective of this educational experience and of us and what happens when they fill in the blanks and vice versa. So I want to talk about their perspective on the university, their perspective on being a college student today, the perspective on faculty, um, which is a little brutal. <laughs> um, before we get to the kind of kids today uh, focus, right? There's so many different kids today. And it's like, well, you know, human beings haven't really evolved much at all since we were like clobbering, you know, tigers with like other tiger bones or something. And, you know, like we haven't changed that much. I think it's really important to take a moment to process how much what we are asking of them has changed and how much what the university is selling them has changed, right? So when I hear this question about student engagement in a class that's not in your major or a class that maybe is exceptionally important but not, um, you know, might, might be more theoretical or isn't at a great time of day, and by this time in the semester, there isn't a good time of day. Like, what's your favorite time of day? Saturday. <laughs> That's it. Um, AU has been changing what it tells students they're coming here for. From a bit more like when I was, you know, growing up in Maryland and looking at schools, AU was one of a hunk of very good liberal arts colleges in DC that you could go to, and it wasn't far enough from Maryland, but nonetheless, it you know, got a sense. Today, we have buses that say, like, here's the exact number of jobs you will get, like, within 14 seconds of graduating from AU. Here's your internship, like, you know, so AU is, as, has told students, right, they'll come here for a very specific transactional reason related to career, and then we're really astonished if something not in their major doesn't motivate them, or if they do the math, not in the math class, but they do the actual calculation and figure out like, this is the amount of engagement I need to have a sufficient GPA to go do the thing that I'm really here for, right? And you ask for that, and that, that is illogical. Like, I'm such a good critical thinker, I've rejected that request because that's not what I'm about, right? And I think we do, I mean, not that I run AU, because, you know, that would be kind of fun and chaotic and kind of punk rock, but um, we could take ownership nonetheless of people who chose to work here and do our, you know, spend our time here, that we're now at an institution that is giving students a message like, you know, this is the waiting room in front of your career, um, or the warm-up area of your career, practice ground. Um, and then feeling as people who are excited about our subject matter or care very deeply about our courses, whatever time of day they might be, um, where's the engagement? Where's the fire to just do this? Um, and part of the answer is, well, A, you told people come here because it's very, because there's free metro past your internship. So I think we have to take a little bit of ownership of that, right? Um, Another thing that we don't take ownership over, but, but just is real, is that um, some, some of us attended school when school was already exceptionally expensive, um, but a lot of us didn't, um, you know, comparatively. Um, so the extent to which our students um, are, you know, 18 with a debt the size of, you know, a condo mortgage um, is not as congruent with a lot of us ancient folks experience um, just the amount of hours it takes to pay for their education um, relative to people before them and um, I guess high video camera AU is not on the leading edge of financial aid. Um, so, you know, I think we need to process that they're, they're walking into a college experience that's asking some things of them that sometimes are going to feel at odds with what we're asking of them. Um, 
And I think that change is as much a part of the kids today thing, or at least a big part of it. And then there are some differences with them generationally too, and technology and diversity and a number of other things. Um, but I do want to get that out there to process what the college experience is in 2019 compared to wherever you went with the cost of housing and the student loans that'll come due um, and the job market that you'll have. Um, and for a lot of our students, the concerns that just based on the makeup of the federal government now and based on the makeup of our student body, a lot of people are going, oh, I thought I was gonna work in the federal government. I'm not certain that's gonna be my track. What do I do with my life? So there's a bit of um, anxiety there. And I think for those of us who are teaching in public affairs or SIS, that's more uh, you know, cogent maybe than, than you know, uh, for some others, but, but it's still there. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, how students see us. Um, and the little caption is I take the history, I like the history professor, but I think he's married in the past. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Their perspective on their education, you know, they have, <coughs> they, comes in part from what they see AU as being about and how they believe AU is treating them. Um, and then the way that they see us. So, one of the things that I did, I have, you know, I try and have a good sense of the student perspective um, as to the extent that I can. And I'll talk about my techniques toward the end of this for making sure I understand where my students are coming from. But I nonetheless did another survey of students and asked them, please, you know, send me um, your thoughts anonymously. So I did this, you know, in a Google form. And what I found is that um, it was very consistent what people chose to tell me. It was very consistent what I've been hearing over the years um, about, from my students about AU. Um, they don't perceive the university as um, taking a lot of their needs seriously. Um, in, in reaching out to them and finding out, you know, what would you like some fellow faculty, you know, and staff to know, um, I got some similar answers that I've gotten before. Um, that the Title IX office and ASAC tend to be very good at working with students, but many professors just choose to blow them off and not honor accommodations, which won't come as a surprise to you know, people working in those spaces, not honor accommodations, um, demands, requests, legal rights. Um, and so students feel in some ways um, disempowered to self-advocate now, I know that the kids today narrative is they want everything, they want everything, they're so entitled, they're so entitled. There's a huge, huge sense amongst many students of frustration that you know if I have a need, it will be considered a failing. Um, and I think that's that's a challenge. Um, and I think that seems to be, you know, we just had our uh, Twitter you know, video incident last night where there was, you know, a dispute in the dorms about the use of racist language. And if you look at what came out in black print or on Twitter, you know, reactions, um, there is a sense among students that maybe AU doesn't care or won't do anything. Now, why is that? Um, in part, and I'll get to the structural kind of relationships between students and professors, that if you think about how much work goes into every decision you make as a coach, as an instructor, as an instructional designer, as a professor, as someone engaging with students, the students often hear the yes or no, and they don't get the why, and they don't know the processes behind them. So the we don't like this talk uh, response to you know someone someone's speech in the dorm last night, um, you know there's many, many pages and long meetings and agony behind, um, behind that answer, which is, well, this, this <coughs> you know, fashions itself after, after public school, so we, we don't punish speech, we don't have something like a you know, speech code. Um, and so we're not gonna punish someone for doing what would be constitutionally protected speech if this was a public university, 
And that's a very complex thing um, and just what you see is the tip of the iceberg, the end result. And for students, um, the missing piece of the narrative they fill in with, um, you know, Amy doesn't care. Um, so before I get to a bit of, of the structural challenges of um, how students see us, how students perceive the system and us as pieces of it, how do you want your students to see you? Or, or, the, or the educational process? Well, I think one thing you just said was really key to a lot of what I experience often. Um, that <coughs> I, I feel as if this particular current generation of students doesn't recognize the amount of work that's going on elsewhere to get to the end result or the conclusion um, that the immediacy of desire and need leads to conflict often when they're not recognizing the incredible detail that often happens behind them at the moment. And we can only recognize what we see though, right? You know, there's this thing, nobody's a born racist. Nobody's a born college administrator either. They don't intuitively know what's going on. But I, I, I mean, I guess I'll say I've experienced this in the classroom in various situations. I mean, we all see it when something like last night happens. And, I mean, I read the Twitter feeds and I saw the reaction of the students, and at the same time, I know Fanta is running around and making things happen. And there's a lot of dialogue going on in terms of what the response will be, how we're going to craft that, how we're, what we should be doing, and it probably didn't even take that long because this felt like something we could respond to in a fairly, fairly immediate way. On the other hand, in the classroom. Um, even when you take the time sometimes to try to describe a lot of the details of what went on, there's um, uh, sometimes a need to, the, the, I don't know how to express this, that what, a lack of recognition of the detail that went into getting to that place. Um, and yeah. I can give examples, but it, it's something that I've, I've been feeling a lot of from students in the classroom. And I, I wonder if that, how would I like them to see us? I'd like them to make sure that they realize that, A, they're not the first students ever to go through whatever the experience might be. Uh, that I often have students go, wow, that exam was, oh my god, how could you possibly do that to us? I, you know, it's been many generations. Not of the exact same exam, but the general, you know, way that the exam is presented and the way that I'd like them to find. So they'd like, you'd like, them to see you as, as doing it right or as fair or? I think in the end they finally see it as fair, but I think their initial reaction is that I've just gone too far for them. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, this time it's personal. And, and it, it's not just exams, like for example, in, in, in a choral situation, we had a long dialogue last year about um, the issues of, of singing uh, African American spirituals. And the dialogue that went on was really positive and really good. It took a long time, and I had guests in, and I did my discussion, and I brought in all kinds of materials. And in the end, there was this, this funny, dismissive attitude among some that, um, yeah, but, despite the fact that there was a lot of material, a lot of great dialogue, it was the, well, we only see it this way, yeah, but. So you'd like maybe more of an open. The openness was there. It's this, the, this is a feeling of like, yeah, what came before isn't, isn't that significant. Like the now is important and what we're doing now. And, and it's not that I was saying it should be one way or the other. It's yeah. that, I'm going to move back to yeah, the question please, though. Of what, what are you hoping they see the experience as or see you or AU or your class or your program as? So I feel pulled because AU calls my evaluate or parts of my evaluation how did I deal with customer service when I don't feel like I am a customer I'm I don't feel like I'm here for customer service and students I feel more and more think that as you mentioned a transactional experience I'm paying for this so I should have it my way when in actuality you know we try to show that we have these systems in place for very valuable reasons and we provide examples and if it doesn't suit their specific exact need they're completely dissatisfied and put their arms up and they're not really willing to engage at all in the process from that point on 
And that is one of our structural barriers we want to talk about as a consumer model of what we do here. Mm -hmm. um, which isn't the way I think most people envision themselves being it when they enter education, they see it as more of a sort of a service and teaching, and mm -hmm. so that's very different. And there are a lot of structural reasons that the students have a consumer uh, mindset. That, that I really love the word transactional, and I, I love how your preface, walking into your presentation today, really spoke to that as, an, as a opening point. Because from a, from a teaching and learning perspective, something I think of all the time is this tension between product and process. And sometimes I feel that when we look at it from a transactional perspective, if that's indeed how students are looking at it, which I'm not saying they are, I'm just offering that, then how can we make it more transparent that it is not just that transactional product, mm -hmm. that the process is a big part of this too? Sure. sure. Or the process is the product, right? You know? Yeah, how about that? Why am I asking you to do X assessment thing? Study, sing this song, study this text, um, do this presentation. Why? Like, what is the good thing that happens, you know, to you, Madison, as a person growing, um, you know, toward what you want to be because you tried this and did this. Um, so, so the process could be a product. Um, um, how else do we want them to see what they're doing here? Well, I, I would like them to see as someone who is. Uh, Really interesting, interested in uh, making them grow as a person and their ability of thinking analytically, and not as someone who is here to be pleased so that I give them a grade. Yeah. So I think that the point is that they maybe see me as someone who's going to grade them and not as someone who's actually cheating for them in, in order to make them better thinkers, let's say. That is so important, and that's one of the structural challenges. I don't think most of us except Jim, see ourselves as, as um, you know, intimidating or scary, right? But our students kind of do in ways because at the end of the day, there's a number on their transcript that matters that they perceive us to be in charge of handing out when they're actually you know, in charge of earning it. And what does that do to that fire and engagement and, and excitement um, and interest in us as people? A number of them are convinced that I make if they read a question and it's a simple question, they always assume there's a trick mm -hmm. because I want to grade them poorly. I want to trick them into giving the wrong one and giving them a full grade. Well, no, it's just a simple question <laughs> <laughs> because I want you to just get engaged in the class and give me an answer. Can I touch on that exactly? Because <laughs> I was thinking, that, well, I want them to think of us as experienced and able and interested in their success but the piece that's been missing is exactly the piece that I think, and I don't want to say kids today because that's not, I don't think that's the whole story, is that for 20 years I've been teaching, there's been a mutual presumption of trust. Yeah. And that's what I see missing, is that your students assume it's a trick question. That's, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm here for you. My friends all make five times what I make. I'm here for you. Right? <laughs> um, but this, this, automatic mutual, this presumed mutual trust is sometimes missing, and that's, yeah. I, I don't know where that absence comes from. Uh, yeah, well, so, I think there are a lot of places it comes from, and we can talk about how to get it, but yeah. Yeah, so, I want them to see me as an evaluator who will be fair, and I actually have my rubrics that I'm using, so if you're not going to get an A, there's a reason for that, and the new generation, everybody wants to be an A student. It's like, how, how, why didn't I get the math score? Well, the math score goes to the host who did everything. <laughs> like that's, you know, you're not an A student, sorry. Rubrics are our friend. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I've never used the word get with grades ever. I have trained myself to say earn. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to them. Oh, you, oh, you're here in office hours to learn why you earned, how you earned that B minus, which is an F. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once you collect it, so well, it's all yeah. yeah, so we can talk about that as well in this trust component. Um, there's good, the techniques and, and rebuilding component of this. I'm going to talk a bit about 
um, the ways that you know pre-conversations, during conversations, assessments, and feedback can build this trust. Um, but so some structural reasons that um, that your students might not see you as you want to be seen. Some is the consumer mindset. Student evaluations of teaching are a monstrosity. They, you know, they. It's strange. We we are now an R something university, which means we're good at research, and all the research shows student evaluations of teaching. It would be better to just like get a trained lemur and have it like sniff around and be like, oh, she's good, and it would be you know be better than SETs probably as a metric. But it develops a consumer mindset. It includes ours do, you know, was the professor available to you outside of, you know, class? It's like, well, you know, that question should probably be phrased, you know, did the professor offer three hours a week or more of office hours or something? Not, was she available outside of class? You know, I am not an on-call, um, you know, PR doc or something. It's not what it is. Yes, you are. What? Yes, you are. Not anymore, and I'll tell you why. And this is a tension too, because what we're going to see is one of the one of the barriers to trust is that they have a very incomplete view of us. But those of us who want to live past like you know twenty eight have have spent time really building our boundaries so that we're not doing a twenty four hour a day job. And so your self care, like no, I actually am not serving students round the clock with like the little McDonald's billions and billions. You know, thing picking, um, but at the cost of potentially people, you know, students understanding um, where I'm coming from. Um, so there's a consumer model. Um, professors and instructors typically have more power to determine how much of our stories we want to share about ourselves. And those of us who create some boundaries, because in part we'd like to, you know have our own lives and in part because we're supposed to be modeling professionalism and most of us take that very seriously. You know, I'm not, I'm not just your buddy, I'm certainly not your mom. Um, anecdotally, uh, my, my sense is that more uh, female term faculty have a lot of sort of mommery involved in our um, roles than, than others. So I've, I've sat in meetings, um, for instance, planning up and have you know, a professor say, oh, nobody ever, you know, nobody ever engages with faculty about that, and, you know, my jaw drops. I haven't had a month at AU where a student hasn't come to me about her Title IX adjacent incident and accommodations and needs ever since they've been here, you know. So some of, some of the boundary creation is very specific to our roles, our identities, our ages, um, how the students will perceive us. Um, so we, we determine how much we want to say, and we also determine how much of our, um, our students' stories to request. Now, we have these asymmetrical relationships in the classroom, you know, where let's say the professor is really that little ball in the middle of the hub. And we hope, and our classes, you know, typically, there's, typically our students like it best when they get to get engaged with each other some. And it is very effective, and I've done a talk in here on collaborative learning. You know, I try and develop my students as colleagues to one another. Um, but in a lot of ways, when you think about what fairness means, right? Fairness means impartial and just treatment. It means equal application of rules to everybody. But students only see the application of rules to them, right? They actually don't have a data point for understanding if you're a fair teacher and an available teacher and a caring teacher unless you tell them, which is really hard because we're trying to make our boundaries and we're trying to have this presumption of trust. Um, but they're not walking in with the presumption. And I'll say for, for our track um, colleagues, um, your students might be running into a sense that their, their lives as athletes, they're feeling like they're not getting the accommodations that they need. Um, I'll say from, and I don't know if others want to chime in who are instructors or faculty or some other student-facing thing, um, actually required to kind of say no to athletes less than we do the other students. It's sort of, uh, you know, alarming. 
where athletes don't necessarily always see, um, you know, how much we're saying no um, to others. Um, and I think that could be a real challenge for a student athlete who's juggling things. Um, I'll also say that, um, that um, you know, if, you, if, if, it, if, you're, if your students are feeling like faculty aren't, um, you know, going above and beyond on like uh, offering outside support, um, it, it, we, we are, but I think that, um, I, I'm not sure the extent to which they're aware, for instance, how limited the accommodations are for things that aren't athletics, like if you work at Dunkin' Donuts to pay uh, your tuition, there isn't an accommodation for you and your you know, time needs that there is for someone traveling for a meet. Um, so uh, I, I can imagine, I can imagine student athletes feeling put upon in that way. Um, I don't know if others want to sort of chime in on that. We haven't had too bad, at least not within our our team, too bad of an experience with yeah. challenges for accommodations because of travel. You know, honestly, when we think about coming from a previous school, last two years ago, been really rather impressed with is the flexibility for that in terms of professors giving the student athletes the option to say there's an exam on Friday and we're traveling on Thursday and Friday to perhaps take the exam early or when they get back. You know, and having that understanding of I know you're not going to be studying at the meet, yeah. and there's no advantage to seeing it later or whatever. But sometimes that just like, man, I just want to get it over with. Uh, but I, yeah, I think you're you're right in saying that they don't necessarily always see their peers' perspective as well. Yeah. And I think I, in our in our sphere, particularly too, those time demands. You know, with us being in the middle and 42 kids asking for an individual meeting each week, it's like, well, it only takes 20 minutes. It's actually 47 hours. Yeah, and, and, and the athletes have an office that is an advocate for them where if you think about our students who are working for money to pay their expected family contribution and that's where their, um, that's where their time is going, there's no, there's no office for them. There's no accommodation for them. There's no one saying, you know, this is a student who you have that we're making work you know, 15 hours a week for money in, a, in a, something that's not a career advancing thing. You know, she's, she's working, she's waiting tables or something. So can you work around that? Um, there is no one. And when we think about you know, this hub, I don't want it to be as, you know, teachers are the only ones with all of the info about how every student is being taught um, and how every student is, is being treated. But the students who have significant burdens that don't fall into a box, international athlete, um, Title IX, disability accommodation, don't, you know, they are aware that there's not a, there's not a mechanism that, that, that requires um, um, professors and, and programs to, to be supportive of them in that way and recognize that, that you know, added responsibility they have. Um, and what it can, what you can recognize if you think about this presumption of, of trust or presumption of mistrust and some of the tension that you might see among your students, um, I think that, that there, that some of the resentments and things that we can see among our students and they're working together, a combination of these realities that they recognize, um, and how individualistic their K-12 education has been uh, really, really makes that harder. And so approaching others with a presumption of trust, um, I think, becomes less realistic the more, the more expensive and burdensome and challenging their, um, their experiences are. Um, students aren't often told what we actually do outside of class. So you talked about the recognition of everything that went into your assessment or everything. Um, they don't know. And online students face even more mystery. Um, if you think of <coughs> like broken up because of like a text or email exchange or you know like an alien, become alienated from another person or like had your blood sugar go or 
blood pressure would go through the roof because of what your uncle Jed said on Facebook or something like that. Um, at least we have those social cues and sort of warmth and body language in the classroom. Um, the access to information about us and the punchline is going to be, you know, we have to share information. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, almost everything can be taught through a Mean Girls Jeff or a Legally Blonde Jeff. So, why do I have, so this is the moment that um, Elle Woods realizes, you know, who actually, you know, might have done it, right? You might have, uh, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I, I would try and draw from my area of expertise. Um, people prefer a false story to an incomplete one, they will guess and fill in the blanks. Um, there is extensive research that shows that when people don't know an entire story, including when they're told the wrong thing, they would rather hang on to misinformation than just have uncertainty, right? So I feel like we should have had our colleague Mark Schaefer in here talking about mm -hmm. the certainty of uncertainty and how great uncertainty is, and academia is probably supposed to be about enjoying uncertainty, but uh, the human mind doesn't have any use um, for uncertainty. Um, so there's all, the, all this research, if I teach the debunking handbook in my Clyde class, there's all this psychology research about how people figure things out and how they hang on to misinformation, misimpressions. Um, and um, there's this, this um, experiment where researchers showed a group of participants um, uh, documents explaining that paint cans had been found at the site of a warehouse fire, and after reading them, um, the participants were told there actually weren't any paint cans, but then asked later, they still pointed to the paint cans as the cause of the fire. Um, and they did that until, until it was replaced with, oh, actually there was an arson. And another example, and this is what got Elle Woods, is in the courts um, accusing an alternative suspect greatly, greatly reduces the number of guilty verdicts that juries come to. They don't, the standard is supposed to be reasonable doubt, right? If there's even any doubt at all. Um, reasonable doubt actually doesn't cut it with the brain. Remember, kids today are different, but we haven't evolved much since we were being chased around by saber-toothed tigers. We see something, we act on it so we don't get eaten is how we, how we draw conclusions. Um, so you actually have to point to a complete story. So our boundaries are, can be good. And we want to be able to, you know, it's none of our students' business necessarily what's going on in our houses or health or something like that. We get to be our own people and be professional and model professional. But I think the thing to understand is that people, it, not just kids today, everybody, write their own story when information is missing. And so the best way to control the narrative about you and your class <coughs> Um, and what you're doing and what your intentions are and why someone should be engaged is to invest um, time in that narrative, um, which includes why are we here, what, are, what is the purpose of this, what am I about, what am I hoping for you. Um, and it's hard because it feels not like rigor, it feels like time on something other than our content. Um, but I think it's, it becomes essential. Um, Could I have this done back on to that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that <laughs> Well, I was about to say, so working with all first-year students, all first-year students, as some of you might know, were required to meet with an instructor during their fall semester, write up, like a, a paper on it and everything like that. And from that, we talked a little bit in class. and. It was when, I'm, of course, the students have to make the effort to get to know the professor, and they went during office hours talking about the humanizing of like what faculty looks like. Of like, oh wait, my professor comes from New York every week to teach my class. Like, once they were able to have that humanizing element, they then said they went back to more and more office hours. Now, of course, they have to make the intention to go to office hours. So, I would have to say that was like a really cool opportunity for them to humanize faculty members. Yeah. Like they gained a lot from it, is what to add to that. Can I make a comment about this? Yeah. Because I have a feeling that humanizing myself, being a relatively young woman professor, <coughs> made me actually be uh, seen as uh, I'm less of an authority. 
Like, I know that's what I'm speaking about. Absolutely. And that's why um, when we get to, um, uh, you know, uh, oops, sorry. Um, learn errors, you decide so much, fill in the blanks about your approach, you decide how and what. It does not mean, right, um, I have a bunch of privilege to spare, so you can call me Chad, and I always wear jeans because I'm super cool. Um, honestly, based on our identities, um, our ages, our backgrounds, what role we play at the university, um, being people's best buddy could actually undermine that presumption of the thing that some of our colleagues said they want, which is I want to be seen as an expert, I want to be seen as knowing what I'm doing, I want to be seen as delivering what they're really looking for. Um, so a story doesn't mean, hi everyone, you know, I have uh, blood sugar, high blood sugar, I'm a Capricorn, <laughs> and um, you know, I have like this sort of odd love-hate relationship with my cat, and complex, <laughs> and you know, um, but it's filling in the blanks of what, what this, this enterprise is about that you need them to know, including, you might have some professors who are very buddy-buddy, and that's one way of doing things. The way we're going to do things is, I'm, I think of this as like a workplace. Like, I want you to be practicing with me the way that you would be working with a boss or a supervisor. And we're going to model that, and that's what our relationships are. So I don't particularly like um, exposing Lara Schwartz's personal whatever in class. Um, I do talk extensively, though, about my beliefs and values and what I think the educational enterprise is about. And I'm very transparent, including about my politics. Um, I come from being a civil rights advocate and a communication strategist and a media um, uh, analyst. And I come in with a media narrative that liberal professors are here to indoctrinate you and make you like not want America to be great again, and all of this, um, and a mistrust and the likelihood that some students, students who d disagree with what they think my positions are, uh, could perceive their marks that they earn um, as something like a critique of their values or something. You know? um, so I talk, I get it out there, I say, I was a gay rights lawyer, I was a disability rights lawyer. I think corporations are destroying our access to our Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial, and it's disgusting. And show me on the dollar where my politics hurt you. Answer, they do not, because we're going to talk about what I'm actually assessing you on. But I take the thing that might be on their mind and say, you know, I would rather fill in the story, take control of this narrative myself, than have you take control of this narrative. Um, and that's why I so agree with your use of rubrics, really being able to communicate with students. Like, there's a place that this assessment came from. The number is, it's not Kabbalah, it's, it's you know, um, but. Uh, so how do we get them to read it? Oh, how do you get them? That's the disconnect, right? Well, uh, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, my students, I tell them I won't talk to them about a paper or, or a grade in office hours until they've assured me that they've read the feedback in the we're not having a conversation about it until you've read it. I'm talking about the before the fact. So I, I, I love that because that's a fine policy to have. But when they haven't read it and they give the presentation, but they only hit three out of five of the items in the actual rubric that you took a lot of time to cultivate. Well, we talk. So I invest, I invest time in the class on talking about expectations. I also, at the beginning of every class, we talk about wanting to know our students' perspectives and wanting them to know ours. So I ask. Um, at, at the beginning of every one of my classes, I have a blackboard quiz that isn't for points, or sometimes it's for one point for a first year class, and I'll say, won't you feel dumb if you got an 89 in this class because you didn't fill out the thing? And it was like, you know, um, and it includes um, uh, that they've read this class policies and procedures document that I have that includes what they're graded on and that it's not politics, neurotypicality, English language, um, uh, native English language, uh, speech, um, a variety of things, what kind, whether they you know, did something in high school that seems relevant, you know, that I'm grading on the attainment of the class. They have to have read it. There's actually a quiz on it. And mine is, you know, a silly one. You know, it asks, 
you know, absurd questions that they're supposed to know. Um, and then I ask them a bunch of things. What are you concerned about? Is there something you want to work on? Is there some part of the content of the syllabus that you've just said under, as, um, and you've certified that this uh, quiz is subject to the Academic Integrity Code? So you actually literally are saying, like, you haven't cheated on whether you read the syllabus in this document. Is there anything about anything that's in this class that I should know as far as your, your access to it? Um, and so I, I gather that from them. Um, and I usually in my classes incorporate um, uh, some goal that they set into their assessment. Um, but they, they at minimally have read my sort of manifesto of like, here's what you can do, including I am not Blackboard support. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not tech support, I'm not Blackboard support. Um, all of it, you know, this is, this is when I, um, you know, this is how much lead time I need to answer an email. All of it and everything in the syllabus. And then I do dedicate time, usually a little bit the first day of class, but more the second day of class, to a conversation about what is the mission of the class and what, um, what constitutes what constitutes success. Thank you for saying that, because I've been here for 42 months, and I work in a world where academic freedom is highly valued. And coming from a communications background, and knowing I work for the School of Communications, I think you know where I'm going on this. And while it is probably your um, prerogative, your choice to do what you're doing, and I cannot mandate that other faculty do that, in online learning, that is said so if I could anyone when I need if you could remember one thing that no one's saying you have to do it but I think you just laid out a perfect reason for that transparency on setting up the course correctly in online learning we don't get a second chance no we don't get a second chance so thank you for saying that and I'm, I'm happy to share I have a few little things like that blackboard quiz thing they're very easy to set up, and like um, the, my class policy procedures document, and um, um, that I that I can share. Um, but yeah, I mean, someone's going to write the narrative, and it's going to be you know. You know <laughs> um, but I do want to as well talk about the narratives that we have about them too. But but there's a bunch of. I don't even know who this person. I just wanted to answer uh, the question here about how do you make people, how do you make students read the rubric? Because I do have the rubric and I have the after test rubric, so you can't get the full score until you read my comment and reflect on that. Nice. So that's part of it. And they they're always like, no. And I said, yeah, you actually have to read my right. feedback line by line and you have to respond to that. But then I still felt that there was a disconnect. And um, although I have, okay, the, you know, this is the purpose, or these are the purposes, learning objectives, and then direction, but just tell us quickly how to do it. And I'm like, no, no, I actually have to read every time. And then you have to read the rubric. So now I have this journal entry, mm -hmm. and I call it the self-efficacy task. And it's like, are you ready to complete this task? Give me a checklist. Nice. What do you have to get prepared to Would know? you not sending? Me that so I can <laughs> put it with the stuff that we share on. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That's that sounds great. Because then they really have to read everything and they really have to look at the rubric and then say and it's almost like they are, you know, typing up everything that's in my rubric, but not quite necessarily in everything, but and that's why it's so worth as well having conversations in class about what's going to be expected about um, you know, in, in an assignment, or what's the point of um, what's the point of what you're learning? Um, so I have my syllabi, and in addition to you know, it's to Tuesday the 9th, You're reading, you know, um, San Antonio Independent School District v. Rodriguez. In addition to what the readings and the assignments are, I actually include class participation prep. You know, be prepared to answer questions about why economic class, you know, doesn't get strict scrutiny, <laughs> um, you know, and so, again, like, I think it comes down to that I don't want to trick you thing, 
Um, I think we need to recognize about our students that their K to 12 education, and I think this, you know, with, with international students, I think this resonates too. Their K to 12 education isn't much like college. They've been obsessing about getting into college, but nothing in that process is like college. You know? It's just, it's like you have two lives, getting into college, doing college. And they've been told college will be different, but not how. Right? So they're confused. This is why I have the confused, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm clear. A lot of uh, the expectations that are just sort of implicit and known and obvious to us are mysterious to them. And I'd say that's, that's 10 times more true with the first year students, which I can see your complex problems class being challenging in that way. Because if you think about, I don't know if anyone has kids or who are in high school or been through high school, um, the, the coursework in high schools is really not replicating what it is it's, it's that we're hoping for, like this idea of critical thinking. Um, it's, it's just not, right? Um, so I think, uh, again, that's, a, that's you know, kind of a narrative that we, we need to be filling in. Um, but so three or four years in from their college experience, they have gotten used to that concept mm -hmm. by Although that many of them have gotten used to the idea that some of us are less fair than others, or some professors are good and some are bad. Um, I check with my students. I ask my first year class introduction of Clegg, Communications, Legal Institutions, Economics, and Government. Do other professors tell you sort of what they basically expect? like what it would take to get an A or what they're looking for. And not a lot of professors <laughs> communicate. My suspicion is that I'm in a room with the people who are most likely to communicate that and that's why you <laughs> came in here. But there is a lot of, I don't know, you know, I don't know what they want. It's hit or miss, surprise about grades, which you don't get with, you know, rubrics. I, I present you know, the rubric in advance, like your paper is going to be judged this percent on structure and logic, this percent on engaging with, you know, course materials, this percent on, um, you know, uh, uh, the special sauce, you know, higher order thinking, which consists of the following thing. Um, so, and all of my feedback includes to take this to the next level, you should. Um, but I find that, I, I don't know if other people have had this experience, I find students coming to my office hours saying, can you help me understand why I got this grade on this other paper from this other person? And my answer is, you know, no. Um, but, you know, you do need to be communicating. I, I get a lot of that as a librarian, not so much after the fact, but just coming in for research help. And I said I'm a business librarian, it's not often in the guide, it's often in another. But students get a lot of assignments that they don't understand, and then they show them to me, and I don't understand them either. So, but isn't that their fault to ask for help? I mean, I mean, it, I, I, I mean, I don't. I think it depends on how approachable they they, they, they see the professor. But, I, but yeah. also, I, I want to emphasize: learning takes time. So, and repetition. What I find about my students: just because I say one day you must do this and that, they are going to get it uh, the first time. You know, it, it takes repetition, it takes a lot, you know, it's a lot of effort to get them to see, even like you said, reading the rubric. It takes time, and you may have to point it out several times throughout the semester, including what your office is, if they want to come and see you. How can they, what is your office? I said, everything is in the syllabus, remember? But, you know, then, depending on, you know, how. And I'm not so, talking about assignments that have rubrics. I'm talking yeah. about assignments that don't have even, rubrics. Uh, yeah. But yeah. even that you think don't have rubrics, because I have. I, I have solutions, but they, sometimes they are going to talk or to the TA. Oh, I don't know what is this. It's not that I didn't give it to them. It's just that they were not open to see it, you know? Yeah. So then it becomes, you, you know, it's hard to. And I, I, get, I get students also asking, why did I get this wrong from another class? I say, just don't know. For me, when I provide something, I try to, to give the guideline and also rubric, and also I try to um, give some like student sample that 
been done with something similar, so they can actually get a sense of what is expected for the particular mm -hmm. timeline. And that, I think it helps uh, clarify a lot of things right? mm -hmm. when you deal with something new. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, the thing is, is that's why my little manifesto that they have to read includes, this is an adult learning community. It is, if, some, if something is challenging for you, it's your responsibility to bring it up in class or by email or in office hours. Like you have to, you have to ask. Um, and I think they, again, I think it's that shift um, for the first years anyway, yeah. and, and some second years, that shift from the approach where things, they're walked through things <coughs> to being a self-advocate. and. You know, they need to be told. I think AUX is, is supporting that and saying, go to office hours, read the syllabus, take ownership, you know, be an adult. But I don't think we should take it as, as assumed um, because there's the elephant in the room, which is parents as well. You know, every semester you get the email from your dean that's like, remember, don't answer parents' questions about, you know, about classes. Um, um, just assuming the message has come that they're supposed to be taking charge and self-advocating, um, you know, it might not. Um, well, as a staff member, I talk with parents more and more. At every single week now, I can expect to talk to two or three of a, of a student who's third or fourth year planning on studying abroad. And that's why before we do, you know, kids today, it's like, dude, where are their parents? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I can't figure out, it's like, all. Gen Xers who were like completely sort of neglected and whatever about things are like you know pulling the strings for their. I mean, my child's basically feral, but you know, um, <laughs> just you know how I like it. Um, so on the international um, component, one thing to realize as well, relative. So they have their perceptions of their place relative to AU, their perceptions of their place relative to us. They've got the perceptions of themselves relative to other students. I really like collaborative work. I think it actually helps your problem with, you know, understanding the rubric and, and engagement as well. Um, you can put them to work, say, so, okay, you're going to assess each other's work, you're going to work in a small group to problem, solve some problems, come back to me, and it takes a little bit off of you, but it, it also gets them seeing each other well. But one thing that I've, um, that I've learned with international students, um, is um, if I'm not clear about it, um, many will take, in, at least in the School of Public Affairs, I don't know if it would be the case in you know, math or chemistry or something, will take their, their non-native English speaking status as a cue that possibly they're not on a level playing field in collaborative work. Which is weird for me, I adopt universal design for learning principles and I'm very clear that I don't, I don't assess people on, on English language proficiency. You can get an A in my appellate moot court um, with English not as your first language because I would want to see how you use legal rules, you know. Um, but um, it seems like an extreme version of imposter syndrome. Um, so in terms of how they see themselves, in my experience, um, about 40% of them see themselves as imposters who don't know as much as other students. About forty percent of them see themselves as experts who like should have gone to you know Tufts but you know didn't quite or something, and then and then like twenty percent of them accurately assess themselves as learners who were supposed to be you know doing this work. Um, but I find that that syndrome of like maybe I don't have that to contribute or maybe I'm a person apart from this learning community is more significant with my international students unless I really get it out there. And then it still takes them a while to leave me, which is interesting and something to work on. I don't, I don't know what it's more you can do than say it, but something has to happen. I think in line with this, um, something that I see contributing to this is also our very like hyper political environment at our campus, mm. and there's a lot of sometimes like performative activism among students where mm -hmm. they they're trying to always show that they know something especially about politics. I mean, a lot of my, so a lot of my work in transfer is with first year students. And many of them have considered transferring. I, I mean, I've only been here, I've been here less than a year, and I've had multiple conversations with students who felt 
thought they didn't belong here because they couldn't talk the talk of like politics or they felt like, um, you know, that, that's, that's the sort of imposter syndrome too, is that where there should be uncertainty and leaning in with curiosity and asking questions, there's a cut from call that culture. I think that's reflective of like larger things too, but particularly here I hear that. I think that's really true here. Um, I started in my first year class, the clay class, um, starting the first day with everyone going around the room practicing saying, I don't know. You know? Um, it is really, really hard for them. And what I find is there's an edge, and so many of the students are so persuaded that their fellow students know something. And I'm sitting here thinking, no, actually, <laughs> sweetheart, no. It's, you know, certainty is not an accomplishment, right? An opinion is not an accomplishment. An opinion is not even relative, relevant to me. I teach political stuff. And I'm like, uh, conservative student, moderate student, person who doesn't care that much about health care compared to other things, you know, Jesus loves you, no one else gives like, we're not assessing your opinion here. It's like, did you learn the thing and do the thing that was our shared miss mission together? And again, I think um, that the key to that is talking to students about what you're trying to accomplish. You know, they have a little bit of a Kafkaesque feeling of what am I doing here? Do I belong here? And filling in that narrative, and I think this gets to the engagement question, filling in that narrative, like, what do you plan to accomplish with this class? Like, what are your values behind being together for three hours a week? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, the, and the other work that they're going to do. Like, what is the actual point of it all? Um, and I think with the political component, what I found is, you know, I teach in SPA, I teach intensely political topics, my common law classes, God, guns, and gays. I mean, it is all the stuff that people fight about, right? <laughs> it's like, and I, I used to be like, oh, the first part of the class is milder that way. It's just separation of powers. So we'll talk about Obamacare. <laughs> Why? Um, and I don't have disputes in part because it's, it is set up as we together are going to get good at the following and here's why. Um, there is an atmosphere of mistrust. I think that idea of a presumption of trust doesn't square with where they're coming from, including where they're coming from in the dorms. Um, it's not. It's not a very sort of interpersonally caring. That's not what we sell. Community. And I think that's the thing to know is when you walk in and the students think that you're unfair or that something was, you know, racist or insensitive or something, they're coming in from a series of pretty bruising interactions 24 hours a day. And they don't have, you know, a so-called safe space. And all of us, you know, actually really do. You know, we go home to households full of people we've sort of curated or you know produced <laughs> um, <laughs> to, to, to want to live with. Um, and they walk into your classroom feeling like they've been swimming around in abundant evidence of sort of hostility. And that doesn't change with some of the people, and I think the complex problems class and the UX, you know, um, some of the people that are a part of that are actually their classmates. And that's really challenging. So those balances you gave a little earlier about imposter syndrome and feeling comfortable like you belong or feeling like you're completely out of touch with what's going on. Are our, does our breakdown here at AU reflect the current generation in most universities? No. Or are we sort of elitist in this way? We're, no, I mean, neither of those can get option C. Right? We have option C. We have our students' level of political engagement. And, and I think some of it is a little bit of like um, mimicking. Like, oh, I'm supposed to come here and have a look. Our students' level of political certainty you know, is through the roof relative to others. But I think um, it's so fun having this on video. Um, you know, our status as a school that's pretty tough to get into, but some of our students that won't have been their first choice, creates 
create situations, let's say. Um, I teach about affirmative action in my constitutional law course. Before I got a little better at teaching, the only times I saw my students upset were on that day. Um, because in my experience, in any classroom full of AU students, there's one or two who believe affirmative action is the reason they're not at Stanford or name other place. And that's festive. Then they think it is the reason that one of their classmates is here. That's um, So I think that's a, that's a challenge, you know, AU's range of students. Um, so what did I do? I went ahead and created a moot court for this semester about legacy admissions and um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> about legacy admissions and, um, and actually athletic recruiting as a, as a disability discrimination defense. Kind of a moot court. <laughs> um, you know, there's there's a degree of the bruises of the weird dysfunctional um, admissions process that I think our students. Our students are really surprised when I talk about affirmative action, when I, you know, in my class, when I talk about it, I did a whole semester on education policy and Clegg one year. They're really surprised to learn only 4% of U.S. college students attend a school that admits like fewer than 25% of applicants, and only 25% of the university that admits fewer than 50%, because for so many of our students, their whole world has been the vast, you know, Monopoly of human experience from Stanford to Rutgers. <laughs> it's like, yes, that is actually the entire diversity of the universe. Just right in that, right in your, you know, Essex County High School. Well then, you know, um, and and so I think that it shapes what they think of us. It shapes what they think of this institution, and it really creates toxic relationships with each other that we have to recognize. And again, on the kids today component. I think we need to recognize how different their journey here was in terms of the, the madness um, that is um, that is um, admissions, as well as um, the, the really bruising reputation that uh, you know, bruising treatment that higher education has gotten in the media as well, and the partisan divide about higher education. Um, we're not. Presumed to be these people leading lives of service and inquiry, or presumed to be indoctrinators. Um, that's what they've read. And librarians among us know that information literacy is not taught in high school, and that that's something we're swimming upstream about. So. Mm -hmm. I think Jim had a question. You said some really interesting things about students not trusting each other. And that shows up on our campus climate surveys, you know, we participate in these various national campus, that they actually think reasonably decently of most of the professors they have, but they think much more suspiciously of each other. And that's kind of a curious thing, I think. And I, I think it talks about some interesting possible sources for them. Yeah, so very quick wrap up on that. What do you do? So um, I do believe that collaborative exercises are really important. I think getting students working together and assisting one another not only takes a little bit of the load off of you, but takes some of the mystery about it. I ask students for information at the beginning of the semester, and I do pause mid-semester and check in and say, how is this going? And we actually have a classroom conversation about it. As of my last day, my course review, I actually spend time, I've, um, the, the common law class I teach, I've taught it 14 times, I've changed it every semester based on the feedback the last day of the class. And it just keeps getting better for that reason. And I'm really glad of that. Um, I invest in time to talk about assignments and what they're for. And I invest in time at the beginning of the semester to talk about the mission of the class. Um, I don't like to talk about, hey, you know, here's me and my dress size and like what my husband does for a living and stuff like that. That's not me, but I am very, very forthright about values and I tell them what I'm looking for. <coughs> Not everybody's going to want to do this. I grade my students based on their collaboration. And I don't just mean I give them a group project. I mean the grade on their group project is significantly about how their colleagues rate them. Did you change the groups throughout the semester? 
Yeah, I, because I do uh, just to, yeah. yeah. It's an opportunity for them to collaborate. I also, to get them doing a little bit of perspective taking about professoring, uh -huh. I, um, I assign them uh, to write feedback on other people. And I, and I critique them on their feedback, you know? And anonymously they engage or hmm? anonymously? Um, no, so like for example, in our moot court, you'll write uh, advice to the person you were partnered with about how she did on her opening statement and how she did answering the judge's questions and what she could do next and whether her legal theory was, and they were graded on that feedback. That's like part of the intellectual exercise and I tell them why. And I guess on the how do you get them to do it thing, everybody is different. I, um, I face whether you can have a record 